Good evening and welcome to tonight's JDRF No Limit Speaker Series event. My name is Kristen Janke and I'm the Director of Community Engagement at JDRF. Thank you for joining us. Tonight marks our fourth event and closes out this year's No Limit Speaker Series. We launched this new program earlier this year, bringing you a new topic for discussion each quarter. Tonight, we're so thrilled to have our good friend Gary Shiner with us to talk about a topic that is always popular, sports and exercise. November is also National Diabetes Awareness Month, so it's a wonderful time for us to be gathering as a T1D community. JDRF's theme for the month is Movers, Shakers, and T1D Changemakers, so it's also the perfect time to have Gary joining us. He's been a passionate advocate for JDRF and T1D research for decades, and he's motivated and educated the T1D community across the world in so many ways. So Gary, we salute you as one of our T1D Changemakers tonight. You'll also hear from one of our amazing JDRF outreach volunteers, Julie Geddes, another mover, shaker, and change maker. Julie inspires and supports newly diagnosed families in JDRF's Pacific Northwest chapter. If you are here with us, it means you or a loved one were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes within the last year. On behalf of JDRF, I'd like to welcome you to our T1D family. You were likely introduced to JDRF through one of our resources like the Bag of Hope for Children or our No Limits Care Kits for Teens and Adults. We hope you found these resources to be educational and inspirational as you began your new journey with type 1 diabetes. We created the No Limits series to continue to provide education and also connection within the T1D community throughout your first year of diagnosis. We know receiving a T1D diagnosis can often be overwhelming and we understand there's a lot to learn, especially throughout your first year. I was in a similar place to many of you nearly 10 years ago when my then six-year-old son Max was diagnosed with T1D. We had so many questions and sports was certainly one of them. Different levels of activity had different effects on his blood sugar. Insulin dosing was often confusing. Knowing the right amount of carbs to eat before, during, or after exercise sometimes seemed like a guessing game. Well, Gary is here to answer those questions and many more and share strategies for managing T1D during all levels of exercise from general daily activity to competitive sports. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. We will have time at the end of Gary's presentation for Q&A. If you have a question for Gary, please use the Q&A feature to submit your question you'll see the icon at the bottom of your screen. Your question will be sent directly to Gary and we will address it at the end of the program. We are recording this presentation. We have implemented several security protocols provided by Zoom to avoid any inappropriate interruptions by unknown third parties, otherwise known as Zoom bombers. If we do encounter any interruptions during the program, we will work immediately to remove these individuals and resolve the issue. So let's get started. I'd first like to introduce Julie Geddes to share a bit about her family's journey with T1D. Julie? Hi, my name is Julie Geddes. My son Christopher was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2001. Chris was in middle school, and like most kids at this age, he was getting taller and thinner. Chris was a soccer player. And he had two hour practices in the afternoon. We live in Montana. It's a pretty arid strait. So we are very conscientious about staying hydrated. I noticed though, that after dinner, Chris started taking water bottles up to bed with him. And I thought to myself, that is odd. I come from a medical family. I have EMT training and I'm a nurse. So in the fall, Chris was invited to a friend's house for a Halloween party. All the guys planned to spend the night, but it was also going to be his first boy-girl party. Christopher came home on Saturday morning and he drank a glass of orange juice. He immediately ran to the bathroom and threw up. I thought to myself, that is odd. On Sunday morning, I looked at Christopher he looked pale, he looked thin to me, something was not right. I told him to go upstairs, take a shower, brush his teeth, we were going to the ER. I walked into the ER and I whispered to the nurse, I said, I might be crazy. I think my son has type one diabetes, please check his blood sugar. And for the first time I said aloud the words that my brain was thinking, but that I didn't wanna believe or I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So she checked his blood sugar, it was in the 300s. 
A few minutes later, the physician walks in and says, yeah, you're right, he has type one diabetes. I was shocked. It was the last thing that I wanted to hear. Like so many families, we did not have a history of type one diabetes on either side of our family. I remember calling my father, he's a physician. I told him that Chris had been diagnosed with type one diabetes. And I will never forget this, my father wept. It occurred to me that my father's generation of physicians likely encountered, encountered T1D patients that maybe suffered from diabetic retinopathy and lost their vision. Maybe they had kidney failure and were on dialysis or possibly they had peripheral neuropathy and that led to amputations or even worse, death. That was a big moment for us. <laughs> so even though I might be able to recognize the symptoms of type one diabetes, I had no idea how to manage the day-to-day -day of this disease. So I went to the internet and I discovered the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. On their website, I discovered amazing resources, and I also discovered a way to get involved. In 2007, I signed up for my first ride for the cure in Sonoma, California. I was not a cyclist. I, this ride was challenging. It was incredibly hilly, but I survived. But the best part about that weekend is that I felt embraced by the JDRF community and I loved learning the research that JDRF supported. I'm still a writer in 2021, and I, I'm also a coach. I actually head to Tucson this week to join some of our JDRF writers at the Tour of Tucson. Over the years, I have discovered more ways to get involved with JDRF. I'm also a research volunteer. I have a science and medical background, and this was a great fit for me. In this role, I get to educate our community about the wonderful research that we support and efforts to prevent, treat, and cure type 1 diabetes. One thing that our research team realizes is that as we invest in advances and new technologies, it is not enough to create these devices unless our T1D individuals have access to them, it doesn't make a difference. So, as an advocate, I take this message to Congress every year. I talk about access to affordable insulin. I talk about access to CGMs and continuous glucose monitors. In my latest role, I, I'm, I'm an outreach volunteer. And as a parent of a newly diagnosed type one diabetic, it is amazing how many things come up that can be overwhelming to navigate. How do I manage the first sleepover for my son or daughter? How do I you know, allow my elementary school kid to go to school and worry about lunchtime and recess and managing blood sugars? How do I think about my kid going off to college? Or how do I think about them managing diabetes during a, during a soccer game? So many of these things can seem overwhelming when your child is first diagnosed. So as an outreach volunteer, it's an opportunity to have these conversations and share strategies and share things that work for me that might be helpful for them. I love connecting with these new families. As Kristen said, I live in Montana and I'm part of the Pacific Northwest chapter based in Seattle. So through our healthcare providers in this region, we get connected to families newly impacted by type one diabetes. In my years as being a rider, uh, one of my favorite parts of Ride Weekend is the Friday sessions that we offer our riders. We offer a Cycling 101 session that off offers basic tips on how to change a flat tire or do bi basic bike maintenance. We offer research updates during these sessions. But my favorite session of all is riding with T1D. Over the years, I have learned by listening. In these sessions, our T1D riders talk about their strategies to navigate T1D while riding their bike 25, 50, or 100 miles. I have learned that it's not enough to have strategies. You need to have backup plans. So many things can go wrong. 
your battery might fail on your insulin pump and you might need a backup. If you're in Death Valley and you get hot and sweaty, your site for your pump might come off and you might have to replace it. But I've learned that that is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more for managing your blood sugars while you're on a bike 20, 50, or 100 miles. Which leads me to introduce our speaker, Gary Shiner, that can talk about these issues and strategies to do something like a ride for the cure for 100 miles. Gary is the owner and clinical director of Integrated Diabetes Services, a practice specializing in intensive insulin therapy and advanced education for children and adults. He and his staff provide consultations throughout the world via phone and in the internet. Gary is a master's level exercise physiologist with particular expertise in advising athletes with diabetes. He has been a certified diabetes educator for 25 years, and he has lived with T1D for 36 years. Gary has written seven books, including Think Like a Pancreas, A Practical Guide to Managing Diabetes with Insulin. I highly recommend it, it's wonderful. <laughs> Gary is a longtime JDRF partner, and we're thrilled to have him joining us to share his expertise on exercise and glucose control. Gary, I'm pleased to turn this over to you, and thank you for being here with us tonight. Well, thank you, Julia. It's a very nice introduction, and I loved hearing uh, kind of the backstory about your son's diagnosis. I, I felt uh, very similar when I was diagnosed. I had lost a ton of weight. Um, I was diagnosed in probably the most unlikely place to get diabetes in the world. It was a town called Sugarland, uh, just outside of Houston, Texas. It's interesting place to get diabetes, I suppose. Uh, so you know, we're going to go through a series of things today, but I will tell you I, what I'm going to provide today. Th these are just some thinking points and introductory concepts. The most valuable teacher uh, is experience. And I would say um, trial and adjustment is what it's all about. And so the things we're going to discuss today are just kind of starting points to work with. And as Kristen mentioned earlier, if you do have specific questions that come up, uh, post them in the Q&A. We'll do our best to get to those uh, at the end of the program. And I'll, I, at the end, I'll leave my contact information up. So if anybody wants to reach out after the program, uh, feel free to do that. I've been a JDRF volunteer for a, a long, long time, and I really love helping uh, anybody with diabetes who's looking for some as additional assistance with their management. So let's start out uh, a little quiz question for you. Let's see if you all can identify my favorite sport to participate in. So keep in mind, look at me. I'm, I'm getting up there in years. I'm bald. I wear glasses. I'm short. I'm Jewish. So, you know, you might think, you know, miniature golf, perhaps, or maybe accounting is my sport of choice, or I'll throw basketball out there. So what do you think is my favorite sport to engage in? Well, it is basketball. Love to play basketball. I mean, I work out pretty much every day, and it's mainly to be able to stay in shape so that I can get out on the court, keep up with the young guys, and, and you know, throw my body around down low, and I really enjoy playing. So I think everyone has to find their own kind of secret motivation for staying in shape. That's mine. I mean, my personal goal in life is I want to live to be 100 and be able to make a foul shot when I'm 100 years old. So what we're gonna to address today, next half hour or so, first we're gonna discuss, it's really a two-way relationship that exists between uh, diabetes and physical activity. And we'll talk a bit more about that. We'll spend a good chunk of our time on prevention of hypoglycemia, which is the major issue that those of us with diabetes face when we're engaging in any form of activity. We'll also talk about uh, blood sugars rising and some things that we can do about that. It's good to know that in every sport, professional and amateur, there are people with type one diabetes who don't just play, but excel. Men and women in every type of a sport, there are people with type one diabetes, but you don't have to be you know, a, a top notch pro athlete uh, to be enjoying sports and, and to exercise regularly. You can you know, be a regular schmo like me and just you know, try to stay in shape and, and enjoy an, uh, your favorite sport from time to time. So 
first, I, I like to explain a little bit about how exercise affects blood sugar levels. So I, I kind of diagrammed out what happens at the cellular level. Think of uh, insulin as those little blue triangles on screen. Insulin attaches to something called an insulin receptor. These are like little doors on the surface of our body cells. And think of insulin as the key that opens those doors. You know, in people who are not physically active, or even in physically active people who have not been active for a while, there are plenty of insulin keys floating around, but not a lot of doors to open. And that's why when we're less active, the blood sugars tend to run higher. When we're physically active, exercising, playing a sport of some kind, you'll notice a number of changes. One of them is that our cells have more doors, more receptors for insulin to attach to. That's called enhanced insulin sensitivity. And that sort of thing can hang around for a while, even after the workout is over. There's also at the bottom right, you'll see a little orange door uh, that's a special enzyme that's created just during the exercise session to allow glucose inside very quickly so that our muscles get enough fuel to burn. And that all combines to produce a drop in the blood sugar during exercise and sometimes for a while afterwards. Physical activity affects our insulin sensitivity in a significant way. During and for a little while after physical activity, our bodies become much more sensitive to insulin. Every unit that we take, whether it's by a pump or injection, every unit we take works more efficiently during and following exercise. So I try to sketch out what this looks like. People who never exercise is represented by that green line. Their, their insulin sensitivity is consistent, but it's always consistently poor. The insulin just doesn't work very well. People who exercise on a regular daily basis is that white line. They have fairly consistent high levels of insulin sensitivity. So it's why it can be beneficial to be active on a daily basis. The red line represents more the typical situation. That's where people exercise a few times a week and they're inactive the rest of the week. It makes blood sugars harder to control because the insulin sensitivity goes up and down throughout the course of the week. And it's hard to predict sometimes how well your insulin is gonna work. So people who act, are active on a daily basis are the ones that have the best shot at managing their glucose levels well. Now, what about in the other direction? How does, how does glucose affect physical activity? Well, those who, who have engaged in any form of exercise know that blood sugars affect our performance. There's a lot of research data that shows that blood sugars affect strength, they have, it affects stamina or endurance, it affects speed and agility, it affects flexibility, our ability to function safely and to focus mentally in any kind of a sport. So think about the kind of exercise or sport you do now. Now imagine that you're stronger, have more stamina, you're, you're faster, more flexible. It really can take your, your performance up a notch or two if your glucose is well managed. What's the ideal glucose for performance? Well, technically we perform well with glucoses that are in a quote unquote non-diabetic range, which is pretty close to 100 but we have to consider those of us who take insulin. If we're running blood sugars that tight, you know, there's a good chance we're gonna wind up hypoglycemic when we exercise. So for most people with diabetes, we're looking for blood sugars somewhere in the 100s during an exercise session. I would say 80 to 180 is probably an optimal performance zone for most people with diabetes. But you can't just think about your blood sugar during the exercise session your performance is gonna be affected by your blood sugar before the activity as well. If you're having high blood sugars prior to an exercise session, it's gonna to lead to a certain degree of dehydration. We all know what happens when the sugars are high, we urinate more and we become dehydrated. High sugars can also affect our sleep quality. If we're not sleeping well, we're not gonna perform well in our sport the next day. Hypoglycemia has an effect as well. 
every time we experience hypoglycemia, the body is going to produce stress hormones that to a certain extent start depleting our glycogen stores. These are sugar stores that dwell within our, our muscles and our liver. When you deplete those, it, help, it starts to limit your stamina afterwards. And hypoglycemia can also affect sleep quality. So in order to optimize your performance in any sport, yeah, we wanna manage the sugars during the activity, but we, de we need to manage glucose the rest of the day as well. So let's look now at what's required to prevent hypoglycemia. Now to start out, let's consider what happens in somebody who doesn't have diabetes. When they begin exercising and the blood sugar starts to drop ever so slightly, the body stops its insulin production momentarily. It drops to a very low level. At the same time, the body produces what are called counter-regulatory hormones. These are hormones that lift the blood sugar up. As a result, with less insulin in place and the body breaking down its own sugar stores, the blood sugar level holds within a nice uh, normal range. People with di without diabetes or even people with diabetes who don't take insulin shouldn't experience hypoglycemia when they're exercising. Of course, the situation is very different for those of us with diabetes. The insulin level during the activity may be at a normal level. It doesn't drop all of a sudden. And if we're exercising after a meal, the insulin level may be much higher than usual. And when the insulin level doesn't drop, all of those hormones that are normally produced have their actions blocked. We don't see the breakdown of energy stores. Instead, we see accelerated uptake of glucose by the body cells. And that's why low blood sugar can and does happen in people with diabetes. So the adjustments that we make depend on a few different variables. The simplest adjustment to make for activity that takes place after a meal is to reduce the mealtime insulin. We call this a bolus of insulin. Those who are on pumps are familiar with that. Those on injections, this is the quantity of insulin that you take at meal times. When we reduce a bolus of insulin, we're cutting back on the insulin for the next two, three, four hours. So if you're gonna be exercising within a couple of hours of a meal, cutting back on that dose of insulin is the best thing to do. But what if the activity is taking place long after a meal or before a meal? Well, the last bolus of rapid acting insulin you took is probably cleared by that point. So if you cut the insulin back at the previous meal, all you've done is drive your blood sugar really high and you go into the activity with a high blood sugar. So a better option is to take the usual dose of insulin beforehand and then just take some carbohydrate before the activity. It's best to take those carbs about 10 or 15 minutes before the activity starts. It allows the food to begin digesting a little bit before the activity begins. And we'll get into more detail about these in a moment. With prolonged activities, like a long-term bike ride that was described earlier, and I've done one of the JDRF rides for the cure. I did the, uh, the ride in Death Valley. I cut back on my basal insulin like you wouldn't believe for that ride. So it's necessary to not just cut back on bolus insulin, but also to reduce basal insulin as well. It's often usually necessary to also snack at regular intervals. And with endurance activity, you need those snacks to provide energy. And if you're gonna bolus for those carbs, you need to cut back on the bolus for those as well. Another thing we have to watch out for is called delayed onset hypoglycemia. We might become very sensitive to insulin from these endurance events, and that can result in a blood sugar drop hours later. So a few specifics. When you're just starting out, if you're not sure how much to reduce a mealtime insulin dose, I would start out with a 33% reduction. So if you or your pump calculates a six unit dose for that meal, take four units instead, do your workout and see what happens. This is where that trial and adjustment teacher comes into play. This is a starting point, but it's going to require some fine tuning. Now, when we adjust the bolus of insulin, we adjust the full dose. 
So once you calculate your dose, it's not just the food part, it's also the correction insulin. It's that combined dose that we're reducing. The exercise makes your insulin work more effectively. It doesn't matter if you're giving it for a high reading or for food, it's gonna work more effectively. So cutting back by a third is a good starting point. You'll notice that at the bottom, I have a competitive or anaerobic activity. It's not always certain that the blood sugar is gonna drop. This is mainly for cardio types of exercise. We'll talk in a few minutes about the competitive and anaerobic activities. When making basal adjustments, it's necessary to think ahead because if you adjust your basal right now, it's not gonna have an effect on your glucose for another hour or two. Those basal adjustments take time to really have an effect. So the adjustment needs to be made at least an hour before the activity begins in order to work effectively. So if you're on a traditional pump, you can cut back on your basal by 50% as a starting point. If you're using a hybrid closed loop system, you can switch it to a more conservative algorithm about an hour or two hours ahead of time. Another option would be to disconnect from the pump, but reconnect each hour and give a small bolus to replace the basal that you're missing. This is an example of why just cutting back on, uh, or I'm sorry, just cutting back on basal for short-term exercise is usually not sufficient. Cutting back on basal is useful for long-term bouts of activity, but during short bouts of exercise, cutting the basal has limited benefit. So this shows that for an hour of walking, just moderate intensity cardio exercise, if you suspend your basal during the workout, in this study, the glucose still dropped an average of 70 points. If you cut your basal in half 90 minutes ahead of time, it still drops about 50 points. If you cut it back by 80% an hour and a half ahead of time, it's still gonna drop by more than 30 points. So in general, this is not optimal. Basal adjustments are not the best way to deal with short-term exercise. We use either a bolus adjustment or snacks or carbohydrates for the short-term activities. For the snacking, a couple of basic rules. The idea is to snack prior to the activity. 10 or 15 minutes beforehand is best. The amount of carbohydrate depends on a lot of things, including where your blood sugar is going into the activity. If your glucose is elevated, you may not need any carbs or you may need less than usual. If it's low, you're gonna need extra. And if you're using a continuous glucose monitor, and I hope you are, they're wonderful tools, you'll adjust the carbs based on the direction that your blood sugar is headed. You'll need more carbs if it's falling quickly and less if it's rising. With prolonged activity, it's usually necessary to snack at least once an hour. And the types of carbs you use, a lot of people say, well, I'm doing an endurance event, I'm gonna eat a slow burning carb. You don't wanna do that. You're always gonna use something that digests rapidly right before and during exercise. You need foods that are gonna pass through the stomach quickly and absorb through the intestines. You start eating a bunch of fat and protein and fiber, that's not gonna happen. Use simple, rapid acting carbs. Sports drinks are a good option, regular soda. Also things like crackers, pretzels. Really anything you might use to treat a low blood sugar is probably good to use uh, before and during exercise. Now, if you're gonna do a prolonged activity and you're gonna use carbs to, to prevent a low, you know, one option is that red line. That's where you take in a lot of carbs beforehand and then just let the blood sugar drop, drop, drop. The other option is to snack at regular intervals every 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes. And that way your blood sugar is gonna stay in your target glucose zone more often. If you just have the enormous snack, you don't spend a lot of time in a, in a performance zone from a blood sugar standpoint. Having the small frequent snacks is a better way to go. And just to give you some ballpark numbers of how much carb is needed for different types of activities, this chart will give you a quick indication. 
the bigger you are, the more carbs you need. Someone who weighs 50 pounds, who's going to do uh, a light dance class might only need 10 grams of carb for 60 minutes of dance. Someone who weighs 200 pounds, who's going to swim at a pretty fast pace, needs about 90 grams of carb to survive that activity without the blood sugar decline. You can see where it might be beneficial to combine carbs with an insulin reduction. The two together would reduce the amount of carb that would be required. Don't ignore routine daily activities. We've been talking mostly about sports and exercise, but just cleaning and yard work and walking, these types of things also burn energy. So you're gonna need some carbohydrate for these. So you or your child's gonna go clean their room, they're gonna need a little snack before they do that in order to prevent a low. I do the grocery shopping for my family. I'm a big coupon cutter. So I've learned over the years, my glucose drops when I shop. So I've learned to cut back on my insulin beforehand, or I'll be nibbling on some things as I go. But now that I have to shop with a mask on, the, the basal insulin adjustment seems to work a lot better. You know, there's a choice then in some cases, are you gonna wanna use carbs or are you gonna wanna cut back on your insulin to prevent a low? Well, the carb supplementation offers a lot more flexibility. You can have those carbs anytime before a sport or exercise event, and they do work fairly quickly. You know, adjusting insulin, you're, you're talking about hours of insulin change that's gonna take place. However, if one of your goals is to lose weight, you may be better off cutting back on bolus insulin. So exercising after meals can certainly be advantageous. But a lot of people end up using a combination of the two. Uh, if you don't want to have to eat a ton of food during or before a workout, you know, adjusting the insulin a little bit can be helpful as well. You know, if you're using a hybrid closed loop system, there's a variety of them out there now from uh, Medtronic and from Tandem. Insulet, Omnipod will be launching one shortly. There's also do-it-yourself systems that are out there like Loop and Open APS. You know, these systems can make subtle changes that'll cause gradual blood sugar shifts. They can't take a blood sugar and make it go up or down very quickly. So they, they're not always that effective at keeping blood sugar from going low during exercise. You can use temporary overrides, temp targets, things like that, but they have to be set well ahead of time. And you're still likely to see somewhat of a drop in the blood sugar during your workout. But where these systems are really effective is in preventing delayed drops uh, hours later. We'll talk about those in just a second. So we have a, a number of things we talked about, using carbs uh, for pre-meal exercise, using bolus reductions for post-meal, and making basal adjustments for prolonged bouts of activity. So if you make these adjustments, the blood sugar should be perfect every time, right? No, there's so many variables. That's the thing about diabetes. We never get it right the first time and nothing follows the textbook uh, solutions that we're supposed to see. When you're exercising, a lot of things are influencing the blood sugar, the amount of active insulin, also called insulin on board, that's still in your body. Where the insulin was given has an effect because that can affect the rate of absorption and the rate of disappearance of the insulin. What was eaten recently? Was it something that's already done digesting or something that's still going to be digesting during and maybe after the workout? The time of day has an effect. We know that early morning exercise often causes less of a drop than the same activity later in the day. Your emotional state can have an effect. If you're relaxed, your glucose will tend to drop more than if you're very intense or nervous or uptight. Even the temperature and humidity has an effect. The hotter, the more humid it is, the harder the body works. And that will lead to a sharper decline in the blood sugar. But if you become dehydrated, the blood sugar will shoot up because of the stress response that that induces. Your familiarity with the activity makes a difference. 
last night I took an aerobics class called Body Pump. I had never taken this class before. And my blood sugar dropped about 150 points during this class. I know if I stick with it, my sugars will drop less. But when we're, when we're new to an activity, whether it's a sport or just some form of exercise, you can expect more of a drop at the beginning until you get used to doing it. How active you've been previously has an effect. If you haven't been active for a while, you're probably not very sensitive to insulin and your sugars won't drop as much as if you've been active day after day. Obviously the size and number of muscles that are involved makes a difference as does the duration and intensity of the workout. I mentioned this before, this concept of delayed onset hypoglycemia. Many people experience this. It involves a drop in the blood sugar hours after completion of some form of physical activity. It doesn't usually happen after short-term light activity. It'll happen after more intense, longer activities though. And the reason it happens is that we deplete something called our glycogen stores uh, when we're exercising for those long periods of time. And after the workout, our muscles are drawing glucose out of the bloodstream to replenish those glycogen stores. Plus we're very sensitive to insulin after the workout. So what can we do about it? First thing is we keep records. You gotta know when to expect this sort of phenomenon. If you find it happens after soccer practice, then you'll know, you know when you need to make your adjustments. And there's plenty of things you can do. You can cut back on basal insulin after the activity. You can take snacks after the activity that you don't bolus for. Now those snacks, those should be the slower digesting kind, things that will take a while. Or use a hybrid closed loop so that if you drop in a delayed gradual manner, it can make an automated adjustment and keep you from going low. Now this is a good general question to ask. Do you think exercise can make blood sugars go up? Well, the true answer is no. Physical activity contributes to a decline. It always burns glucose. It always enhances insulin sensitivity. But we're not exercising in a vacuum. You know, blood sugar is being affected by a lot of different things. So this constant balancing act that we're performing. Insulin and physical activity contribute to a decline in blood sugar. Food and stress hormones contribute to a rise. With some forms of exercise, we produce a lot of stress hormones. You know, things like high intensity weightlifting, sports that involve quick bursts of movement, sprints, any kind of performance where we're being scored or judged. And you know, when winning becomes the main objective, there also tends to be a lot of adrenaline production. So if you, if you come to learn when your blood sugar is gonna rise and by how much, you can prevent it by thinking like a pancreas. Your pancreas would make a little bit of extra insulin under those conditions. So that if, if you know that with you know, a competitive game, your sugar's going up 100 points, well, before the game, give yourself enough insulin to prevent about a 50 point rise. You know, give half the usual amount you would need. We use half the dose because the exercise is making our insulin work more effectively. Now, in some cases, blood sugars can rise after a workout, and that can be caused by being disconnected from a pump or suspended for too long. It can occur if you had a big meal before the workout and it's still digesting afterwards. It can occur if you overconsume carbs during the workout. It can also rise due to the production of stress hormones. And in some cases with intense activity, lactic acid can build up and contribute to a rise. So the solutions are kind of common sense. Uh, you know, make sure you're not disconnected for long periods. You need to reconnect periodically. If you are eating right before a meal, you might want to split your bolus, give half of the meal, half of it after the workout's over. Use reasonable amounts of carb as well. And I mentioned the, the lactic acid. With high intensity workouts, that's pretty common. And one way to flush lactic acid out is with a nice long cool down at the end of the workout. It's a good way to minimize lactic acid buildup, which causes insulin resistance. 
One other question that often comes up, is there a blood sugar that is just too darn high for safe exercise? And the answer is there really isn't. There's no evidence that exercising with an elevated blood sugar is dangerous. Now, it may affect your performance to work out with a blood sugar that's high. As long as you hydrate and you know, give yourself a conservative dose of insulin, you should be okay. And again, if you're high right before a workout, I'd give half the usual dose to cover the high. The exception is if you are ketotic. The presence of ketones is a sign that your body is severely deficient in insulin. It's dangerous to exercise when you're ketotic. At a point of like that, again, you need to hydrate, you need to give insulin, and really need to wait until the glucose gets back to a healthy range and the ketones have cleared. Preventing ketones can be done by, uh, you, know, you, you do want, well, preventing ketoacidosis, I should say, can be done by checking for ketones before a workout if you have an unexplained high reading. If your glucose is high because you, you know, just ate a half a pizza, you know why. But if, you, if your glucose is elevated for no apparent reason, do a ketone check. If ketones are present, then you need to act. You need to you know, hydrate and give yourself insulin by injection right away. If, you don't, if you're not ketotic, hydrate, give yourself a conservative dose of insulin, you should be okay to exercise. And I mentioned about the reconnecting and uh, disconnecting part. Uh, you don't never wanna disconnect from a pump for more than 90 minutes at a time because your body can become severely deficient of insulin by the end, towards the end of that workout. So it's better to reconnect hourly and bolus uh, maybe half of the basal insulin you would have received during that time. So bottom line, with any form of sport exercise you choose to try, there's nothing you can't accomplish if you think like a pancreas. You, know, you could ride 100 miles in a JDRF ride. Uh, you might be able to play a professional sport at some point uh, if you work at it. But it does take trial and adjustment. You know, what I presented here are some starting points that you can work with, uh, but it is going to take some trial and adjustment to get it just right. Now, I, I'm going to leave this screen up. So you know, mark down uh, my email address, Gary, at integrateddiabetes.com. Uh, and check out my practice's website. We have some nice resources there. Uh, and take my phone number down, too, if you want to reach out. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions that we didn't get to cover today, you know, I'm here for you. So we can go to the Q&A now, if you like. Wonderful. Thanks, Gary. That was such great information. We do have several questions, so I will go ahead and um, get started with those. We Let's talk about specific sports. We've had some um, questions around long bike rides, downhill skiing, how to keep blood sugar up during some of those strenuous activities. And if you could address um, strategies for those who wear a CGM and insulin pump and for those who do daily injections. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, for those who are on pumps, the adjustments are back are a lot simpler because we, we can adjust basal insulin and we can also make bolus adjustments in fairly you know, precise increments. Uh, so for endurance events, uh, we usually have to cut back on basal insulin starting 60 to 90 minutes before the activity begins. Uh, and we usually also have to consume some carbs along the way. Small carb amounts every 30, 45 minutes are a good idea. But if you consume larger amounts, like if you stop for a meal in the middle of, of the activity, you'll just want a bolus for half of what you actually consume. Now, of course, this is going to take some, some practice. So when you're training, you know, run yourself through it through different few different scenarios. Try different amounts of basal adjustment. Try different amounts and types of carbohydrate until you find something that keeps you within a reasonably healthy zone through the course of the activity. For those who are on injections, you can accomplish similar things. The tricky thing is the basal insulin because the injected basal insulins tend to last 24 to 36 hours. So if you're gonna be engaging in an all day type of an event, cutting back on the basal insulin the night before or the morning of the activity can be done. You know, taking the dose down by maybe 20 or 25% will certainly help. 
So the issue here is you can't just cut the basal during the activity. It's going to be reduced for that 24 to 36 hour period. So there may be some repercussions from that. And for those on injections, the meal doses can be adjusted just the same way. Uh, you know, reduce it by a percentage, 25, 33, 50%, uh, depending on the nature of the activity you'll be engaging in. Great, thank you. Um, we've had several questions around recommendations for what type of glucose to take during exercise when you are experiencing a quick drop in blood sugar, for example. Um, and what would be considered a small amount of carbs? And do people need to worry about all of those carbs kind of catching up with them and, and causing other issues? Yeah. Well, th the best thing for treating a drop in blood sugar is the same thing you would use to treat hypoglycemia. Dextrose is gonna bring your glucose up faster than anything. So glucose tablets, glucose gels, and any candies that contain dextrose like Smarties or Sweet Tarts are great to use. Uh, during an activity, uh, liquids tend to absorb very quickly. So using things like a sports drink or a regular soda can work nicely. The sports drinks in particular work well because they're a lower sugar concentration and they tend to absorb very, very fast. So that's a good thing to use if the glucose is falling. Uh, you know, but think about what we call high glycemic index, rapidly acting carbohydrates. Those are the best things to use before and during uh, any kind of sports activity. After the activity, if you need a recovery uh, type of a food or you want to prevent a delayed drop, then turn to the slower acting things like peanut butter and yogurt, and whole fruit, milk, those kind of things will work nicely. Uh, what's a small amount? Depends on the person. The smaller the person, the less carb you're going to need. So that's something that really has to be customized for the individual. You know, the average child who, who weighs 50 to 100 pounds might only need 5, 10, 15 grams to get through an hour of activity. But for an adult who weighs 200 pounds, you know, that's not going to last very long. You're going to need a lot more than that. There, there are charts in, in my book, Think Like a Pancreas, also in John Walsh's Pumping Insulin and Using Insulin books, there are charts that show how much carb or burn per hour in different forms of exercise. Those provide a good starting point. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Those were good tips. Um, so we've had a few questions around insulin sensitivity and consistency of exercise. So if you vary your exercise intensity, so one day you might do a light walk, strenuous cardio the next, weight training the next, et cetera, will the sensitivity tend to maintain at the higher level of exercise, or do you need to keep up the same level of exercise to get more consistent results? Well, we're really splitting hairs now. I mean, if you're active on a daily basis, you will generally have a nice level of insulin sensitivity. Uh, if you run for 90 minutes, you'll probably have more insulin sensitivity than if you lift weights for half an hour. So, you know, the cardio exercise tends to do a bit more for improving insulin sensitivity than strength training or anaerobic exercise does. The duration will have an effect as well. So there will still be a little bit of ebb and flow depending on the kinds of activity you do. Uh, you just have to be prepared you know, following that workout. It's really the 24 hours that follow that you have to be conscientious about how sensitive your body is to insulin. What some people do is they alter, they, they alter their target glucose depending on the level of activity they had the previous day. On a, at following a very active, high, high activity day, they might raise their target 10 or 20 points. Days where they had very little activity, they might lower the target a bit to accommodate for the fact that their, their sensitivity to insulin might be off a bit. Okay, thank you. I know that 24 hour rule um, is good to know. That was something that was new information that we learned when my son was diagnosed. The effects of exercise can la last so much longer than you might anticipate. Um, a, a similar question, how important is it to exercise at the same time each day to achieve better blood glucose control and insulin sensitivity? 
oh, it's got to be exactly the same. Time. <laughs> Nobody can do that. We have lives to live. It, it's not. I mean, if you can do it, great. You'll probably be able to manage your glucose a little bit better. And you'll probably be able to stick with your workout plan longer if you can do the same, you know, do it at the same time every day. But that's not realistic. Most people need to vary it based on their schedules. And that's why you need to be able to apply strategies for an early morning workout that are different from a pre-lunch or a post-dinner. You need to develop strategies for handling any kind of time that you and any kind of type of exercise you do. Great, thank you. Um, so we have several questions around basal adjustments and just some specific questions and maybe just some clarification. So when uh, someone is using injections, should they ever adjust long acting insulin for exercise? Do you adjust fast acting insulin? What might a strategy be if you are doing daily injections? I mean, if you're taking insulin by injection, I wouldn't adjust the long acting insulin unless you're going to be engaged in a long term activity. If you're going to do 30 or 60 minutes of exercise, you don't want to change your insulin for 36 hours. In a case like that, you know, you'd be looking at adjusting just your mealtime insulin that you take beforehand. But you can adjust the injected long acting insulin if you're going to be engaging in a long term activity, if you're going to work in the yard all day, if you're going to bike 100 miles in Death Valley. You know, endurance events like that, yeah, you can benefit from adjusting the injected basal insulin that you take. And with the caveat also, this is the kind of thing you should run by your diabetes team before you do it. Just because I'm saying it doesn't mean it's right. There may be a reason that you need to be on a consistent dose from day to day. Great, thank you. And then with automated insulin delivery systems, the activity settings can be adjusted to give less basal insulin during exercise. So there are some questions around using that as an effective tool um, versus maybe disconnecting or suspending the insulin pump. Can you talk a bit yeah. about that? I've used every different hybrid closed loop system that's, that's come out. And I, I can tell you from both personal and professional experience with my patients that the, the automated adjustments, they help, but they don't solve everything when it comes to exercise. It's almost always going to be necessary to still apply the strategies we talked about. I, I call them the old school methods of going back and using food or using a manual bolus adjustment to prevent a low blood sugar. So you know, changing the, you know, the target or changing the uh, sensitivity, putting it in exercise mode, putting on a, a, a temp override, depending on the system, can help but you're still probably going to have to make these other adjustments at the same time. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, from a, a newly diagnosed teenager um, who's still really in his honeymoon phase mm -hmm. and is doing cross country running as an example. Any suggestions as he's getting into that sport and still in the honeymoon phase of his new diagnosis? Well, I'd say enjoy the honeymoon. I never got one. I mean, I think I went a long time with serious symptoms before I was diagnosed and it just knocked my pancreas out. So I didn't enjoy a honeymoon. I mean, during a honeymoon, you can get away with a lot that you won't be able to get away with once your beta cells stop functioning and producing any insulin at all. Uh, but it's such an individualized thing. If you're still able to produce some insulin, you know, it may be enough to prevent you from going low because your beta cells will stop secreting insulin when you begin exercising. But if your beta cells are hardly working at all, just a tiny bit, there's a good chance you'll still wind up low when you work out. So it really does depend on the, I guess, the amount of honeymoon you, you, or the stage of your honeymoon that you're in. If you caught your diabetes very early and your pancreas has, is still very vibrant, you don't have to worry that much about hypoglycemia. Some small adjustments might be all it takes. You may not even need any adjustments at all. But you know, if, if your pancreas is on the way out, if you're on fairly large doses you know, based on your body size, uh, you're gonna have to make your own adjustments. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have a question just asking if you can talk a bit more about the cool down 
after exercise. Sure. Uh, during the cool down, if you, you know, with a prolonged cool down, it's a good thing for a number of reasons. It brings the heart rate and blood pressure down gradually. It's good for the circulation. It's a good time to stretch because that's when the muscles are loose and warm and you're less likely to pull things. You get more effective stretching by, uh, by doing so after the workout during the cool down period. Uh, but you know, that cool down is, is good for also flushing out any lactic acid that might've built up during the workouts, so you're less likely to see a rise in the blood sugar after you're done exercising. Uh, so cool down is a pretty important part. And it, often it doesn't have to be anything other than a slow version of the exercise you were doing, just at a very comfortable, easy pace. For most people, a five, 10 or 15 minute cool down works nicely. Great, thank you. Um, so I think this will be our last question. Um, and this is also from, a newly diagnosed teenager, a 17 year old who was just diagnosed this past September. He used to participate in crew in rowing and is nervous to continue to do so. Can you offer any tips or advice on how he could start up again? Uh, yeah, go for it. Um, there's no reason you can't participate. Uh, you can always figure out ways to manage your glucose uh, when you're in crew, there are ways to keep yourself safe. Yeah, it's going to take uh, some communication with your coach, your teammates. Uh, you'll need to be prepared you know, with rapid acting carb. You'll probably want to make sure your coach has one of the new glucagon formulations like the nasal glucagon or the pre-mixed uh, GVOC pen, uh, just in case you do have a serious low. Uh, but you should be able to participate and, and you should be able to kick ass uh, in crew or any sport you choose to do. If you think it through and manage your diabetes well, nothing should hold you back. Great answer, no limits, right, Gary? That's what we like to say. <laughs> well, Gary, you never disappoint. We always learn so much from you and we always have so many great questions from the audience. Um, I think we got to most of them tonight. There might be some specific ones that we weren't able to answer, um, but again, please make note of the information that Gary has shared on the screen. Um, he is uh, anxious to hear from you if you have additional questions. So thanks again, Gary, for sharing your wisdom with us tonight. Julie, thank you for sharing your family's story with all of us. It's always inspiring to hear from our volunteers and we're grateful for the time you spend as an outreach volunteer, welcoming newly diagnosed parents and individuals to the JDRF family. For those of you who may be interested in a personal connection with a JDRF outreach volunteer, you can submit a request online at jdrf.org. We've posted a link in the chat. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. We encourage you to connect with your local JDRF chapter to learn more about the programs and activities that are happening in your community. If you aren't yet connected to a chapter, you can find your nearest chapter on jdrf.org and we'll post a link um, to that in the chat as well. As I mentioned, uh, National Diabetes Awareness Month is this month in November, and it's really the perfect time to raise awareness for T1D. Share what you learned tonight and help someone better understand what life with T1D is like. We also invite you to follow along on JDRF's social channels to hear more inspiring stories from volunteers and community members, and you can join the conversation and share your story with us too. Thanks again for joining us. Our next No Limit session will be hosted in February. We'll have more information to share at the start of the new year. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.